let's start by reviewing what we learned uh, in one of the last lessons about binary addition. So just go through that and work out what the correct answer is, okay? Pause the video and have a go. Is it A, B, C, or D? You'll find the correct answer at the end of this video. Today's focus is going to be looking at describing the practical applications where something called binary coded decimals and hexadecimals, which you already know, are used. We're also going to be looking at showing an understanding of and be able to represent character data, which is obviously text, in its internal binary form, depending on the character set used. So we're going to be looking at ASCII, extended ASCII, and Unicode. So let's begin. One of the first things I want to do is introduce some key terms. Make sure that you jot these down somewhere, as these can be the ones that are those one mark questions that come up and they're normally definition based. So you need to know what binary coded decimals are, you need to know what ASCII code means, what character sets are, and what Unicode is. So do pause the video and make sure that you jot these down. And while you're jotting these down, I'm just going to be just giving you some basic information about why binary coded decimals are actually used. Now it's okay to kind of do binary digits and you can convert binary numbers into binary numbers and that's all fine. But there are use case instances where we need to represent things like time. We need to have actual digits and somehow time doesn't work really well when you try to code it as a binary number. And same goes for things like timers in washing machines or dishwashers or microwaves. These digits need to be represented exactly as they are. So in those particular cases, we end up using binary coded decimals. And you find these everywhere, from the digits on your calculator or on a clock display. And there are greater uses as well. And eventually, I think uh, later on when you get to, say, section 13, you'll probably find that it's very difficult to represent exact values in decimal notation in computer memories because there is something called floating point representation which means you end up with an approximate rather than an exact answer. So when it comes down to financial transactions that could become you know, quite tricky. Like for example on a shopping till you don't want uh, a shopping bill to come something like 11. 00000001, something like that. You want it to be exactly 11.25 or something like that, which, which, which works in, in real life. And that's where we end up with the use of binary coded decimals. But let's begin by looking at hexadecimal and its uses. So this is a bit of recap from um, IGCSC. And I think you already know a lot of this. So the, the biggest use at A level that we think about is memory dumps. Of course, there are others that, you know, we, we know HTML and CSS color codes, MAC addresses, all, all of that's there. Even in assembly language, you probably are going to be using hexadecimal, but the one that we're interested in are memory dumps. And wh why do we use hexadecimals for memory dumps? Because they're much more easier to work with. That's one of the greatest use of it. Instead of having a long string of binary digits, it's much easier to have a sequence of hexadecimal digits. And when you're developing new software or when you're trying to trace errors in programs, hexadecimal is often used. When your program crashes, chances are the contents of the memory are dumped to either the screen or to a printer. And in that particular case, hexadecimal codes come in handy because they might just give you the location of the the address itself so you can find out where the error lies. The program developer can look at each of the hexadecimal codes and determine where the mistake is and then they can go about correcting it. So using hexadecimal is much more manageable than binary. It, it in fact is a powerful fault tracing tool but it requires a lot of knowledge on you know the programmers behalf about what the computer architecture is and how to kind of translate the results that they see on screen. Okay, now back to binary coded decimals. So BCD normally uses a four bit code to represent each binary digit. So kind of like hexadecimal in a way, but obviously in binary form. And the way it works is that you take any digit and you just simply write the 
binary equivalent. So if you've got 4210, you're not going to store it as a long string of binary digits. You're just simply going to store four separately, two separately, one separately, and zero separately. So the four-bit code can be stored in the computer either as a half a byte or two four-bit codes stored together in the form of one byte. So 4120 in, in two bytes would actually be 0100, which is four, and then 0001, which is one, followed up by 0010, which is two, and then 0000, which is zero. Similarly, if, if you wanted to kind of do it in four single bytes, you could do that as well. It's on screen, so pretty straightforward, nothing tricky about it. Just re remember that you will not take the entire number and convert it into true binary. You will just take each digit and convert it to four-bit binary, which is kind of like hexadecimal. Now, we already highlighted the uses of binary coded decimals, and you need to make sure that you know exactly what they are. So representation of digits on a calculator or a clock. Why? Because decimal values are very difficult to represent in binary. Using binary coded decimals, we can use it pretty easily. And all of this is to do with a technique called floating point representation, which is a topic in year 13 that you'll be looking at. You might want to have a look at it if you're interested right now. At the moment, we simply use fixed point notation, which basically means that every digit is fixed and it's an easy solution rather than using the floating point one. Okay, so that's numbers. What about text? What about special characters? And in this case, we use things like character sets. So the most common character set that we use is called ASCII, and the ASCII code system, or the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, was set up back in 1963 for use in communication systems and computer systems. At that particular point in time, computers were predominantly in the English-speaking world. So you had kind of ASCII, which gave you a character set of English characters, both uppercase, lowercase, and then control characters, such as tab, your control key, all of escape key, and all of those kind of things. Uh, ideally, this character set could fit into a 7-bit memory code, and you ended up with roughly all the characters of, which are present on your standard keyboard with, uh, I think, an additional 32 control codes, which included both deanery and hexadecimal versions. Now, on screen, you see uh, probably a very poor picture of an uh, ASCII character set. Maybe just go online and just have a detailed look at it. Now, what actually happened was that when people started using computers, they found out that there were other languages, and the Europeans came on board, and you know, you had French and other languages. So extended ASCII was created, which used 8-bit character codes and just extended the character set. And then eventually what happened is that the whole world started using computers, and they re realized that there were a lot of different types of languages out there. For example, Chinese, Japanese, Cyrillic, Gujarati, Urdu, Greek, you name it. And at that point in time, Unicode, which stands for Universal Code, was established back in 1991 to create a standard covering all languages and writing systems. To keep compatibility with uh, older systems like ASCII and extended ASCII, the first 128 characters are the same as ASCII, and, and that allowed Unicode systems to work very easily with older computer systems which were still using ASCII. Since ASCII code had a number of disadvantages, primarily that not all languages could be represented, and it's you know, obviously unsuitable for some purposes. Think about common uses of emoji and icons which aren't part of ASCII, then Unicode allows up to 65,000 character codes represented if you're using a 16-bit version of it. But the problem with Unicode itself is that despite creating a universal standard that covered all languages and all writing systems, there were also different versions of it. So you had 8-bit Unicode, which was called UTF-8. Then you had 16-bit one, UTF-16, and obviously you ended up with UTF-32. So it kept on expanding. And that caused a greater problem that when you were looking at normal ASCII with its seven bits, you could represent the character A in seven bits. But with Unicode and UTF-32, you will probably end up using 32 bits to represent the character A. So UTF file sizes tend to be a lot greater than, than ASCII ones. Okay, enough about theory, so let's do a task. 
So try to encode your preferred name using ASCII in binary and hex, and then try to work out the number of bits you've used. Then you might want to try to do the same thing using Unicode encoding, and then see how many bits you use there. And then you can do a comparison to see, okay, what the difference in file size is. This shouldn't take you more than 10 minutes, so pause the video and have a go. Okay, well hopefully that was a fun little activity. Move on to something a bit more serious now. So go back to Python. Your task is to create a converter that allows you to convert between binary, hex, and decimals. And if you can get in binary coded decimals, that's fantastic. So think about it, you've got a menu system which allows the user to specify which base they're entering a number from, what they want to convert to, and then the program does the, the rest. You can put a loop around it so obviously it repeats itself. Share it with me via REPL and I'll give you some feedback. Okay, this is end of lesson, so hopefully you should be able to give a use of what hexadecimal and BCD are used for. You should be able to explain why hexadecimals are used in computer science, and you should be able to explain what the difference is between ASCII, extended ASCII, and Unicode. You should also be able to explain the problems with Unicode and ASCII, and that's about it for this lesson. Uh, just in case you were wondering, the answer to the question at the beginning of this lesson was A, and if you got that, which I'm sure you did, fantastic. And that's all for now, and I'll see you in the next lesson.